Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Today's guest is P.D. Mangan, or Dennis Mangan, and he's a writer and online health coach uh, who talks about health, fitness, and nutrition. And he's uh, the author of six books, including Dumping Iron and Stop the Clock. He lives in California and is known for his heterodox opinions about most important ways to stay healthy and fight the aging process. Um, Dennis and I have followed each other on Twitter since I don't even know when, but it's many years ago. Um, We both had under 5,000 followers at that time, and yet we were both interested in what we uh, both have to say. And we've been following each other since then. I've learned a lot about health and nutrition uh, from him, and I think he's uh, uh, picked up on Bitcoin from me, so I, I hope I've uh, paid him back in that. Um, and I wanted to bring Dennis on today to talk to him about uh, aging, because I think he's got a very low time preference approach to aging in that, um, you know, um, the focus of his health advice is how to stay healthy and how to live long. But not just live long, also live well, you know, not just um, putting um, more uh, uh, birthdays on your uh, resume. It's about living life longer and being able to enjoy life. And so he approaches it with that perspective and comes up with very different conclusions from what you would expect um, from your average certified expert. And it makes for a lot of interesting Twitter content when he runs it to some of these certified experts and <laughs> their very uh, confident assertions. Um, so uh, he joins us today to discuss this and many, many uh, fun <laughs> stories about the world of nutrition, diet, and exercise. So Dennis, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Saifa Dean. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you've had some pretty distinguished guests here before, so uh, I, I hope I'm uh, I hope I can say uh, some reasonably intelligent things here today. I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Um, so, first of all, tell us a little bit about your background story and how you ended up in uh, this corner of the internet, telling people to uh, exercise and eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I I have a background in microbiology and pharmacology, which I studied way back in another uh, epoch in in uh, university, um, and so uh, I got interested in health and fitness uh, pretty early on. Um, probably, I I like to think of it, looking back on it, as a consequence of my own father's health. Uh, my, my father was a doctor who developed heart disease at a relatively young age. And, um, you know, I saw what he went through and I was determined, uh, that I, I was determined not to do that. I determined that I was at least going to try, uh, to, to remain healthy, uh, and, and especially free of heart disease. So, um, you know, very early on, uh, I, I started doing a lot of things. B- basically, um, I started running. So this would have been the 1970s when the running craze was just getting going. Um, and I liked it. So I kept at it. Eventually ended up running long distances. I've run a couple of marathons in my life, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, also following pretty mainstream advice, um, I you know, started eating less meat and, and less animal foods because, you know, every, everyone said, uh, oh, saturated fat is going to clog your arteries and this kind of thing. Something I now know to be false. And, um, so I, I did that and, you know, eventually becoming a vegetarian. Um, so, you know, everything was going along pretty good for a while. And then in middle age, I became ill and um, I saw a lot of doctors about this. It was all very mysterious. Ultimately, I got a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. So uh, that went on for quite a while. Um, you know, a hard, uh, I, I hardly got any help at all from doctors, most of whom were fairly dismissive of, um, of me. Uh, you know, basically, hey, your lab work is is uh, normal, and uh, you know, you seem normal, so there's nothing wrong with you, or I can't help you, or something. So, 
uh, this went on for a while. And at some point I figured out that if I was ever going to get over this, that I was going to try to have to figure it out for myself. And, um, so I, I jumped in trying to start figuring it out, got diving into uh, the scientific and medical literature and so on, which I was already reasonably familiar with um, because of my background. So, um, you know, very early on, I figured out that a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that mainstream health, mainstream, mainstream media and mainstream health sources were telling us about health and disease and aging were, if not entirely wrong, some of them were entirely wrong, but if, if, if some of them were not entirely wrong, then very misleading um, that didn't, didn't really reflect what was in the scientific literature. So um, eventually I changed my ways personally as far as my exercise and diet habits. Um, as far as exercise, I had long since given up running because I was unable to because of my illness. Um, and as far as diet, uh, I quickly discovered that um, being a vegetarian was probably not a good idea. Uh, this, this was actually pretty startling for me when I first came across it. Um, and you know, then, so I, I quit being a vegetarian and after a while I started getting better. And, uh, then when I started feeling better, um, I, I had always wanted to exercise, but had been unable to, but I decided I was going to lift weights. I had, I had done some weightlifting at various times in my life and I decided I was going to do that. So I did. And, um, I, I really rapidly got better between the diet and exercise. Um, I, I admittedly starting from a pretty skinny base, I put on about 25 pounds of muscle in my first year of training. Um, and, and sorry, how old were you at that time? So, uh, I would have been, um, about 55. Um, so, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm 66 now soon to turn 67. Um, so I did that. I felt a lot better. And then at some point I had remembered something I said to myself during all that long odyssey of, of illness and everything. I said, if I can ever figure this out, I'll need to write about it. And uh, so then, oh, yeah, you know, I remembered yeah, I need to write about it. So I wrote my first book uh, about chronic fatigue and, uh, you know, put it up on on Amazon. And and then um when I was done with the book and had done that, I thought, well, what do I do now? Okay, well, I guess I'll just keep writing. So I did. And uh, I wrote a bunch more books and, um, you know, got on Twitter, have a website and so on. So, you know, basically, that's how I got here, where I am. Yeah. And so you, up until 55, you were basically um, in, in pretty bad health. And now you're 66 and um, you, you, you deadlift. What is it? What's your deadlift now? 300 or 270 uh, or something uh, like that? Uh, well, I, I have, I've deadlifted uh, 320 pounds once. Yeah. So I'm not quite doing those heavy weights like that anymore. Uh, I am working out with weights, of course. But, but yeah, I was, I was deadlifting that much. Yeah. I mean, the key and most inspiring thing here is that um, most people think of um, their you know, 40s as just a continuous decline in your health. And is that, that's kind of normalized that things, your body's going to start falling apart and you, your doctors are going to just try and help you survive with it for as long as you can. Um, and that's taken as normal. But here we have somebody at 55 that begins a drastic improvement in their health. And it's just completely transforms your life, right? Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. And, and that, idea, that idea that um, you are just sort of doomed to decline is so untrue. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at aging uh, from a scientific point of view. Of course, there's a lot of uh, study of aging going on right now. And um, there have been some very interesting breakthroughs. 
But the thing is, when you look at humans and aging, what is the what is the most um, salient aspect of that aging as it manifests in most people as they get older? Really, it's obesity um, in a nutshell. It's it's gaining body fat and losing muscle, and this is what most people would consider to be aging. So I'm older, therefore I'm out of shape and, uh, you know, I, I've gained weight and, and all this kind of thing. There are of course other aspects of this, but it's, it's completely true that, that obesity and its accompanying illnesses accelerate aging. Um, so if, if you look at aging, um, you know, if you try to define what aging is, um, some, some people have said that aging means it, it is an increasing risk of death. So mortality rates go up as people get older and, or any organism, virtually any organism. There are some organisms that don't age, but most do. Um, so mortality rates go up. Um, and, and so, um, that's, that's what aging is, but, but, um, this association in human beings with, uh, gaining weight and losing muscle and, um, lower levels of physical fitness is, uh, basically a self-inflicted wound. If, 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 so what aging does is, is it increases the risk of all illnesses of all diseases, right? So, uh, there are aging associated illnesses, the, the major ones we think of like heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's infectious diseases. These are all very much associated with aging. So you can look at, at the converse. If, if aging increases the risk of all diseases and obesity also increases the risk of all diseases, which it pretty much does. It increases the risk of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and so on infectious diseases then you can say you can see the parallels there between obesity and aging so the overall point i'm trying to make is that much of this doesn't have to happen um you know obviously we all get older but most of what most people would consider to be aging is just the consequences of an unhealthy li lifestyle that is in turn caused by either unwillingness to do what's required or in many cases bad information that they're getting from the mainstream yeah absolutely i i um i think it's um it's very interesting the issue uh, i mean the way that you do this is, is, is extremely interesting that you're out there you're not putting your credentials out there and telling people hey i have these um degrees or the, these publications in these journals and um you know um i can um i, I i'm <laughs> i'm licensed to tell you how to live your life because i have these credentials you're just out there and telling people you know here's what i'm gonna tell you to do and it's very different from what the people with credentials are doing. So your only way of success succeeding is on the market. You know, you have to actually get people to <laughs> fix their lives. So they go online and they um, say that, and then people see it, and then attracts more people for you. It's a great example of how um, how health and um, diet and exercise advice and all of that stuff. It on a free market, it's uh, it, it it would function much better than in the dysfunctional kind of uh, uh, guild system that we have, where uh, a central fiat authority assigns um, these things. So you're just out there delivering actual real results. So people come to you. You know, it's not about what the books say and what the textbooks say and what uh, um, the scientific authorities tell you, and not about what the FDA does. You just do what works. So. Um, and, and, and it turns out it's, it, it's very different from all of the things that we see about aging. What, what, the fascinating thing here is, I mean, uh, a lot of people have all these crazy ideas about how to live long lives. You know, think about somebody like Ray Kurzweil and uh, his ideas of, um, you know, immortality. And you look at him and you can see, like, he clearly doesn't lift. <laughs> and, right and he clearly doesn't eat enough steak in his diet and like i can't take seriously your attempt to live forever 
if you can't make 45 minutes for lifting and you know a, a couple of pounds of beef a day well maybe a couple of pounds might be a bit much but you know a little at least a little bit more beef like he clearly doesn't eat enough steak and um it, 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 the, the, this is kind of really the, the fiat mentality of just imagining that things will come from some lab expert that's going to discover a magic pill that's going to make us live forever when, you know, meanwhile, we're just letting our body deteriorate. And if the magic pill doesn't come along, you'll die prematurely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, there is... Um... There's a certain amount of ideology in the anti-aging uh, area. Uh, m maybe movement would be too strong a word, but there are a number of people out there like Ray Kurzweil or uh, David Sinclair, for example, who are known for their research into aging and talking about it and also what they're doing themselves. And I think that, for instance, when I say ideology, um, <clears throat> I'm talking about, like, for example, um, David Sinclair's uh, book, Lifespan, was a big bestseller a year or two ago, uh, still selling a lot, I'm sure. And uh, he's very well known. And he devoted really a lot of his book to talking about um, the environment, um, to talking about all kinds of, you know, what we would think of as basically, you know, liberal issues that really don't have a lot to do with aging. So, you know, you, in thinking about how that goes together, um, w well, it may or may not go together. But the fact is, as far as it concerns aging itself, I think that many of these people get on the on the wrong foot because of it. For example, David Sinclair, he advocates, you know, pretty much plant-based eating. Um, I, you know, I don't think he's uh, gone completely vegan and I don't know that he necessarily advocates that. Um, and I believe Ray Kurzweil is quite similar in that area. And I think uh, that that is mistaken. Um, they, they are using, um, for example, I have seen Sinclair linked to some uh, research that, you know, supports his idea of plant-based eating. And it is all based on the same incredibly weak nutritional epidemiology that got us the dietary guidelines and got us where we are in the first place with record levels of obesity and so on. And he seems to take all this at face value without looking at what goes into nutritional ep epidemiology, such as, you know, so-called validated dietary questionnaires, which are, which have been shown to be basically worthless. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's this whole thing as regards to, um, the experts, uh, you know, some of my more, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, frank and open friends on, on Twitter like to, like to say, well, you know, if you go to your doctor and you see that he's overweight, well, you know, like, why would you listen to him? Um, he's he's either, you, you know, the doctors themselves, you you wouldn't think they lacked anything in willpower or discipline, right? They, you know, they work hard to get through university, to get through medical school, to get through their internship and all this. And then they work hard on the job 50 hours a week or whatever, you know, these guys, these guys are, uh, you know, serious people uh, working hard. And then you see that they're overweight and there's a high rate of o being overweight and obesity among doctors. And so why is that? Hmm. Well, maybe they have bad information. Um, you know, they, they, they don't know how themselves to, to stay in shape um, because if they wanted to, you would think they would. Um, so then these same these same doctors are giving advice to their patients about how to stay in shape so um yeah the you know the experts i mean i recently just just the other day i saw a comment on twitter they were talking about statins okay and and there was a doctor an expert a very highly credentialed expert at a major uh medical center saying look 99 plus percent of cardiologists agree with statins. 
And, you know, I'm thinking, so, okay, so these are the same cardiologists that told us to consume seed oils that told us to consume less meat, um, you know, this kind of thing. So because 99% of them, uh, do that really doesn't, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, doesn't hold a lot of weight. It really tells us that 99% of cardiologists um, get m money from uh, the companies that make that drug. Let's be honest here. That's what's really at work. Um, the amount of conflict of interest that exists in the health industry is obviously astonishing. And people don't see the um, people don't see the conflict of interest from the perspective of you know once you see it from the perspective of fiat money, where it allows government to basically dictate what's science and what's not science, it's it, it's an attack vector on your health really. It's 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 a security failure in 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 your ability to keep yourself healthy because if you continue to trust what the experts say then you're just opening yourself up for anybody to put people they want to say, the, the people that they want to say the things that they want to say in a position where they get the credentials and then they fill your head with the things that they want you to hear. And um, it's it's amazing. So you, you mentioned David Sinclair, and I think that's, uh, I, I'd wanted to discuss him. David Sinclair is kind of the Paul Krugman of aging, in a sense, <laughs> like he's the he's he's the poster child for what the uh, you know the the, the the New York Times reading Harvard going uh, people want to think about the world at this point. You know, in the same way that Krugman provides this kind of perspective on economics, David Sinclair is providing this perspective on aging. But his ideas, as you say, um, it's I mean it's. Um, Really, you start seeing the consistency across all of the people that come from Harvard in particular, where it doesn't matter what field of specialization they come from or what issue they study, they somehow magically all end up arriving at the conclusion that you should eat less meat and you should eat more processed shit. And there are many routes they take to arrive at that conclusion. But, you know, usually the route that they take is to go through plant-based. And in a sense, you know, people, when they think plant-based, they think, you know, um, ideally Garden of Eden where um, beautiful fruits just uh, come to you. But really, if you're eating plants and, you know, if you make plants the majority of your diet, then you need large quantities of plants. You know, you're going to be eating several pounds of plant matter every day in order to produce that kind of diet for you and for the millions and billions of people that are eating this amount of money you need massive kind of industrial agriculture so these um you know plant foods you think about all of these nice uh, things as if they're pristine but really it's it, it's massive fields where you need to completely destroy the local ecosystem. You need to completely destroy um, all of the plants that exist in order to produce monocrop agriculture. That's the only way that we can have supermarkets. Um, they need to produce at scale. So you have these large fields of monocrop agriculture, and that's great for industrialization. There's a lot of money to be made from that. And of course, I think that the point that I try and emphasize in the fiat standard, which um, which, which you know, I think Bitcoiners will be quite sympathetic to is that there's the other incentive for industrial food is not that just that it's very cheap, but also that it's useful for uh, governments to uh, cover up inflation. So if you switch away from eating beef to eating soy, that's going to cause inflation to <laughs> drop. You know, the estimates of the CPI are going to be lower if you're eating the cheaper food. And that's what naturally happens. As inflation happens, as prices rise, people have to substitute away from the expensive goods that they consume into the cheaper goods. And so the CPI measures the average price of the basket of goods that people uh, consume. But the price of the basket of goods is governed by your income. So if prices rise, you, you know if you have $100 to spend a month, you're still going to spend $100. Even if prices double, <laughs> your consumer basket is still going to be 100 bucks because that's all that you can buy. So instead of buying beef, you buy soy. And you know the CPI only shows up as 1% or 2% because um, you, 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 you're you you substituting away. So I think this you see this in, uh, in, in terms of food. You see it all over that these industrial foods have a very high... Um, 
uh, or, or very low responsiveness to price because they can be produced in very large quantities of industrialization. When prices rise, you know, you feel the price spikes happen first in real food, you know, in um, um, food that requires a lot of uh, time and effort to produce. That becomes more expensive like beef. But um, crops um, that can be uh, monocropped, you know, you can find other uh, virgin land, destroy it, and uh, keep running up uh, numbers, higher numbers of uh, output, and prevent the price from spiking. So th there's this aspect of it, and then of course there's the aspect of um, not eating enough meat. I think this is this really is why I think the meat agenda is very popular. That not eating meat makes you hungry. And so they tell you, you know, don't eat meat and eat all of these amazing, idyllic uh, Garden of Eden crops. But in reality, you're going to be hungry. And if you're hungry, they have just the thing for you, which is processed food. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Um, th this, what you said about the Garden of Eden, um, there's, you know, that that relates back to the ideology that there's, um, you know, there's something good about um, eating, eating uh, plant based because, uh, you know, in the in the Garden of Eden, they just uh, ate from, you know, the fruits or, you know, whatever, it, whatever it was that was there. And and, uh, you know, according to the Bible, meat eating didn't happen until later. Um, so there's this. Uh, uh, sort of mindset of that, uh, you know, plant-based eating is good in this, you know, in the sense, not just good for your health, but good as opposed to evil. Um, so this, 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 this very much, um, you know, wraps up into this plant-based ideology. Um, you know, you, you, it's an interesting uh, analogy, be, you know, about Sinclair being the Paul Krugman of, of aging. Um, and 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 all the Harvard views and everything and how they sort of uh, all all managed to arrive at this same place, um, you know, with with Sinclair's audience, um, I I don't think let you know let's let's say if he if he uh, you know suddenly decided in his own mind that eating a lot more meat and less plants was going to be healthier and prevent aging i i think he would have some great difficulty saying this because he's precisely cultivated this audience um you know that that says the opposite and you you know with his with his best selling book and so on you you it it, it's much harder to say this kind of thing. So I think it is uh, skewed his, uh, you know, his, his uh, uh, thinking about what really causes aging. Um, and, and so, um, and then yes, these, all these um, ultra processed foods, like you were just talking about safetyine um, that are so easily manufactured, they are very profitable because the ingredients uh, in them are so cheap that, you know, three main ones being vegetable oils, AKA seed oils, sugar, and refined grains. And so you can produce these very cheaply, um, put them into boxes or bags and, uh, slap really colorful labels and logos and brand names on them and then advertise them. And people really, uh, go for that. That that's what everybody wants. And, and, these ultra processed food companies have, uh, you know, they have uh, food scientists and engineers on staff designed to make this food as addictive and enticing as possible. Um, I mean, you can imagine if you have a product that's literally addictive, then, you, you know, you, your customers are always coming back for more. Um, so that, you know, that's what they try to do. And, um, yeah, I mean, in, in, uh, you know, a, a box of breakfast cereal, for example, that, that, um, you know, uh, sell, might sell for $5 or whatever on the shelf, the actual, uh, raw materials, the, the raw ingredients for the food, like for example, in a, in a box of cornflakes might cost only about five cents. And the rest is, you know, they, they manufacture it and then they put it in these boxes and advertise it. Um, so they, they are really profitable. Um, and, 
yes, this, this monocropping that goes on, like you were talking about, um, this is really environmentally destructive, whereas um, a lot of, for example, um, you know, pastoralism, meat raising can go on on relatively unproductive land that you can't use for anything else. Um, so, yes, the 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 um, demands of industry and the demands of our way of life, if you want to call it that, really point towards these ultra processed foods, these cheap ultra processed foods as the way that, um, you know, everybody can make a lot of money and we don't have to think about the, the larger choice choices for our health. Um, but, but then they, they want to convince you that these things are the right things for your health. And they absolutely are not. They, they get into things like, um, you know, talking about the merits of various foods and, or like if you eat, um, five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, you'll be healthier and, and this kind of thing. While they really overlook the elephant in the room, which is all these ultra processed foods, that's what people are eating. Recent reports show that 60% of the calories or, you know, or more uh, of what Americans eat is ultra processed foods. And these things are uh, promoting the obesity epidemic, they're, they're basically killing us. So what are your um, most important take-home messages on what to do about uh, food? What should people be eating in order to age? I know to age well, I should uh, say. R- right. So the, probably the most important thing is to avoid the ultra-processed foods. Okay. So you want to you want to eat real whole foods only, and so here we're talking about meat, fish, eggs, some dairy, some fruits and vegetables, perhaps. These things are all sold on the perimeters of the supermarket. Okay, the ultra processed foods are sold in the middle of the supermarket, and um, you know I do health coaching, and I have talked to people all over the world, and everyone tells me the same thing in India, in South America. Those things are always sold. The ultra processed foods are always sold in the middle of the supermarket because that's what they want you to buy. That's what's uh, that's what's the most profitable. And the real whole foods that are on the perimeter of the supermarket are kind of an afterthought. They don't, you know, necessarily want to direct you that way. So that's the most important thing. It is is to eat real whole foods only. And then of course, you know, you get into particulars in, in the way of eating. I'm definitely a big advocate of animal foods, of meat and eggs and dairy. Um, people, so these, these foods are the best sources of protein uh, and people are really lacking in protein. Even, even uh, the official guy, you know, RDA for protein is, has, is underestimated. And there is solid scientific literature pointing to this. But even with this RDA that isn't good enough, most people aren't even meeting it in terms of protein. And that has serious consequences for health and for their body weight. Um, more protein is, is definitely better. Um, so, so there's that you want to eat more protein. You want to eat real whole foods. You want to eat more protein. You don't want to eat the ultra processed foods. Um, you know, it, and, and if people did only those two things in terms of diet, and then if they did some solid exercise, um, you know, most of our troubles would in, in my view, vanish, um, in, you know, in terms of health, you know, type two diabetes, is a huge problem in the United States and increasingly over the rest of the world. Um, and yet there, there is solid scientific research. This is not fringe at all by any means that type two diabetes can be reversed. And, you know, most, um, you know, we're, we're just told that it's a chronic progressive disease, that you, the only thing you can do is take drugs against it and that it will get worse. And by stopping to eat, you know, stopping eating that triad of sugar, 
and refined grains and vegetable oils, people can reverse it. But you see, this goes against the narrative um, because plant-based foods are supposed to be so good for you. I mean, if, and if people stop eating those, uh, you know, generally by necessity, they're going to be having to eat more meat and so on. So this, this idea, this fact that, that type two diabetes can be reversed is, is very much, um, well, like I say, it goes against the narrative. It's really not talked about that much. Um, you know, when, when, uh, people go to a doctor with type two diabetes, it seems unlikely in most cases that they will be told this. Um, I, I had a friend who, uh, a couple of years ago, he was, he was an older man and he, he went to the doctor and, um, got a diagnosis of type two diabetes and, um, the doctor, um, told him, you know, well, you, you know, I can offer you drugs, metformin or something. Um, and you know, or, you know, you could lose weight. Doctor told him that you could lose weight. And I didn't tell him how or anything like that, but my friend decided, well, okay. Um, I, I'm going to lose weight because I don't want to take the drugs. So he went, you know, stopped eating all the garbage food that, that, uh, he had been eating before and started doing a heavily carnivore ketogenic diet, lost 50 pounds at the age of 72 and reversed his diabetes. And, you know, he would tell me all this stuff they're saying, this guy was definitely a guy that didn't have a whole lot of interest in health and fitness. That's how he got into type two diabetes in the first place. But after he had lost 50 pounds, he was, he was telling me unprompted that, you know, all, all the stuff they're telling us about diet and nutrition is bullshit. Um, and, and so, you know, with something so simple as that, as stopping to eat the, stop eating the ultra processed foods, the, here's this major health problem that affects millions of Americans. And like I say, many more people across the world, increasingly that can be solved this way, but it's astonishing. It, it, it's just it's just not politically correct to say so really it's insane it's absolutely amazing i think um the majority of people don't even know the connection between diabetes and sugar the connection between uh, blood sugar and diabetes in arabic the word for diabetes is the sugar disease so at least you've got that which you know makes it hard for people to deny it but i think in 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 uh, in, in the us most people think this is just, you know, quack science, fringe science. Um, the idea that you blame diabetes on sugar, you, you know, if they get into diabetes, uh, if they try and understand it and they see that, yeah, sometimes food spikes the uh, diabetes, uh, food spikes the blood glucose level, they'll think that that happens because of eating fatty meat. And if you just cut down on meat, then you, you'll, you know, you'll be all right. But anyways, you have to eat and you can't not eat uh, carbohydrates and diabetes. The astonishing thing about it is that, uh, you know, you mentioned doctors themselves. And a lot of people in many professions, um, Nina Teicholz makes this point that you see, um, you know, army generals, you see CEOs, um, highly accomplished doctors, surgeons, uh, ex-athletes, people who definitely could not have accomplished what they accomplished if they didn't have willpower, you know? You can't finish med school unless you have serious self-control. You know, it's gonna require you to sacrifice a lot of fun days in which you could be doing a lot of fun things, but you have to stay home and memorize all kinds of things for your exams. That's the only way to finish med school. So these people do have a lot of self-control and you see these people um, in many cases, you see their health deteriorating very badly. And, you, you know, it, it, you, you can tell somebody like that, you know, actually, it's really rather simple if you ate this instead of eating that. Um, and, you know, they definitely would have the willpower to pull it off because it's not as hard as people make it out to be. Um, people think changing your food is hard and that it makes you feel bad. It doesn't. Um, it's not dieting in the sense of, you know, you're hungry and starving all the time. On the contrary, you have high energy and your food cravings go away. 
it can be done if you just understand uh, what it is, which is, you know, get rid of the most toxic stuff and eat the most nutritious things. And that's 80% of the battle won. And that's going to, you know, you don't have to be a complete Puritan about it, but there are a lot of low-hanging fruits that you can pick out of your diet and a lot of... Uh, low-hanging um, ribeyes that you could add into your <laughs> diet that will make a very big difference. And um, it, it's, it, it's, it's astonishing how much misinformation there is out there on diet. People really, really like to complicate their life. I mean, what you just said, you know, avoid the processed food, eat whole foods, and um, add as much animal meat as you can. That's so simple. And it's uh, basically everybody's Maybe not everybody's grandmother, everybody's great-grandmother or great-great-grandmother would recommend something very similar. And yet the vast majority of people think, um, don't even think this is a possibility. Yes, absolutely. There, there is so much misinformation out there. Um, it, it, you know, so, so much, actually, there's so much bad information. Let me put out that, put, put it that way. That term misinformation, I, I guess, is... Uh, fallen into some disrepute lately. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one thing, so why are, why are people, why, why do we have this obesity epidemic? Um, you know, there are, there are a number of explanations and then you get into proximate causes versus ultimate causes and so on. But one very simple explanation is that people are hungry and so they eat more. Um, and, and so you, you wonder, well, so why are they hungry? Why are they hungrier now than they were, let's say, 40 years ago or 50 years ago or, you know, you know, longer ago? Why are they hungrier now? Well, it has to do with what they eat. Um, so in starting in the late 70s, um, the United States started a great uncontrolled dietary experiment when they told everybody how to eat. They told them to eat more carbohydrates um, and to eat less meat because this saturated fat was allegedly so bad for you. That that was the origins of that, and so uh, people more or less uh, obeyed. You know, so the low fat craze caught on. People thought, oh, I shouldn't eat fat, or I'm going to get a, have a heart attack, um, and so they did it. And that's exactly when the obesity epidemic started. Um, so you got to ask yourself, okay, well, um, you know, what's going on here? Are, you know, are, are people hungrier? There are some very good scientific explanations, for example, having to do with protein. If people are eating less protein, they're going to be hungrier because uh, they need to get the protein. So they will keep eating food until they get it. And so if they're eating lower protein foods, they keep eating it. So that is one explanation for why people gain weight. Um, another way of looking at it is that these, the kind of foods that are out there that we typically think of as junk, the factory food that has a lot of sugar and, uh, you know, seed oils and everything else in it, um, is pretty addictive. So and it, that, so that people can't stay away from it. So people, you know, if even if you show people how they can be less hungry by eating real whole foods, they still have this problem, um, you know, with these other, you know, addictive foods. It would be might be something like, um, you know, telling a hero, heroin addict to go get fresh air and sunshine and you'll be fine. Um, you know, it doesn't really work. So, um, you, you know, so why are these you, you, you've probably heard about some of these experiments where um, rats preferred sugar to cocaine. Um, and, you know, so, you know, there's, some, there's been some debate about, you know, whether addiction is the proper, um, you know, phrase to describe what's going on. But the fact is, these things are very enticing um, and, and do things to our brain that makes us want to eat more of them. I, I mean, just speaking personally, you know, on, on the rare occasions where I have something like this, like, for example, over Thanksgiving and Christmas recently, um, I, I'll start eating something and, you know, that I don't usually eat. Like my favorite example is pumpkin pie with whipped cream. I start eating one of the, a piece of that. I'm like, oh my God, that tastes so incredible that even while I'm eating one piece, my thoughts are going to win, you know, I, I'm going to get another one. 
as soon as I'm done with this one. So most people are experiencing something similar on a daily basis. Um, and, and, you know, so between the hunger and you know, the hunger on the one hand and addiction on the other, it's, it's difficult, right? So people think that they need to cut back, right? So this is, this is the basis of mainstream thinking on diets. You need to cut back. You need to uh, calorie count your food or, you know, do portion controlling or something like that. And then what does that do? Then people are hungrier than ever. And, and so then they're, they're trying to use willpower to get through and, you know, they, they can't do it. It's, it's not sustainable because, you know, sooner or later they, they, they're saying, damn it, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm just going to eat, forget all this. And, and then they're back where they started. So this is the futility of, you know, the mainstream dogma, eat less, move more. Um, you know, it, it's just been a massive failure. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you could say that it's uh, just, um, it, it happens to be that they're wrong, but on top of the incentives for pushing this agenda in terms of, um, you know, hiding inflation and um, political palatability of trying to convince people that food is not getting more expensive because if you just eat the cheaper things, which are healthier anyway for you, then there's not much inflation. I think there's the, the fact that these processed foods are so addictive and so they're made to be so hyper palatable, I think uh, is something that must have been picked up by um, marketing analysts over the last 50, 60 years or so. So I think, uh, you know, nutritionists can do a lot of uh, pseudoscience in their academic departments, but I think marketing people in a hyper uh, in the super processed food industry um they don't do a lot of pseudoscientific bullshit because i think they have a very very strong incentive to get their marketing right and i would be I'd, i i would be willing to bet that over the years they've figured out that people who don't eat a lot of meat end up craving our processed junk a lot Whereas people who eat meat a lot end up avoiding that hyper-processed junk. And so there, there has to be some kind of marketing angle that pushes in this direction. It must have been discovered in some way, in some kind of um, you know, data mining or um, focus group or experiments, whatever it is. And it, because once you've tried to eat a lot of meat, you see just how much... Uh, so right you know, these things are still addictive. And as you said, you know, when you have the pie once, you want to have another piece. Yet still, if you're eating a lot of meat, there's a limit to how much you can have of all of that stuff. You'll have another piece, all right, but then you're just done. Whereas if you're hungry and if you're not eating a lot of meat, there's no limit to how many pieces you can have. You can just keep having, well, there is a limit obviously, but um, it's a significantly higher limit. Um, you, you can eat more because you're ravished, you're hungry all the time, and uh, your body is craving any amount of nutrients that it can get from those things. And obviously they do have some nutrients and they're also highly addictive. So you start getting nutrients from very inefficient sources, which involve a lot of digestion, a lot of working your, immune, your digestive system, but only getting out a small number of nutrients, which aren't enough to keep you uh, healthy and uh, thriving. Um, y yes, a absolutely. Um, these, the, the marketing people, I, I, I mean, I think that's a great point. The, the marketing people do what works. Um, they, they, they don't care about the ideology or anything. They're going to do what makes their company money. Uh, and, you know, the, the, uh, maybe yet yeah, the marketing people definitely. And then what I referred to earlier is their staff of, uh, food scientists and engineers. There's been, there was a very good book about just exactly about this written a few years ago called, uh, fat sh sugar, salt, and fat, something like that. Um, where, you know, all the, you know, this quest to make foods as hyper palatable as possible and therefore as addictive as possible and to keep so to keep people coming back for more um it it, it is so true when you eat meat um, and you eat other real whole foods you you are just less hungry and um you know i mean with without 
you know, totally giving away my secrets. This is what, this is what I do in health coaching is, is, you know, most of my clients um, want to lose weight and I show them how to be less hungry. And it has to do completely with ditching all those other ultra processed foods and eating real whole foods. So um, yes, that, you know, the, the, the marketing people know what works. The thing is that biologically, uh, you know, we human beings are hardwired for this stuff. So, you know, we talk about the big food companies and uh, and so on and how they're all doing this with their marketing, um, you know, but but the fact is, like with my example of the pumpkin pie, we human beings figured out how to make foods like this, uh, you know, a long time ago that were just very, very enticing. Um you know, but what what has happened now, there are different ways of looking at this, but what has happened now is these foods have all become so much cheaper, which, you know, relates to, um, you know, the in, the inflation idea, like you were talking about, Saifedean, uh, you know, with the, with the real whole foods becoming relatively more expensive, and then these um, high calorie, high sugar, you know, uh, foods becoming cheaper, so they're much more available now. Um, and so people, you know, instead of having, you know, instead of having ice cream on Saturday night, like I suppose that, you know, people used to have done now it's every night or it's, you know, during the afternoon every day or, you know, because it, it's all there. And, and, you know, people, so Mark, you know, what, what the what the food engineering and the marketing is doing is basically hacking into the human brain and seeing what is you know the most addictive um we didn't really have that capacity before in the sense of this you know mass manufacturing um and, and you know but but now the these things are so available um that every, and and people want them and furthermore a lot of this stuff really does comport this ties back into the dietary guidelines um, that were you know started around 1980 that you know we're not supposed to eat as much meat that we're supposed to um, you know eat more carbs and so on I mean people you know people think uh, eating you know, a, a box of crackers is, is healthy because, you know, it's, you know, low in fat or something like that. And a lot of people really do still think this. So, you know, it all ties in. Uh, uh, some ways of looking at it were that these dietary guidelines were put out there by the U.S. government. And then the food manufacturers jumped on it. So, you know, they all said, okay, this is, this is how the government wants you to eat. So we're going to make all these um, ultra processed foods that, that, you know, are healthier to eat than, you know, eating the meat and the eggs and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what are some of the other uh, major misconceptions that, um, or mistakes in uh, modern fiat nutrition science? and health in general you mentioned statins maybe um, that's worth a look what do you think of these i i am uh uh very unimpressed by their benefits they show pretty uh pretty small health benefit i i'm tempted to say trivial um you know some studies sh show that you know like people who take them for five years or something like that have, uh, you know, two days longer lifespan, you know, something that, like that. And yet they have a lot of side effects um, uh, that, that are basically strongly denied by most people in the area. They, you know, and, and there, there are just tons of stories out there about people getting massive muscle pain or, or uh, cognitive uh defects and so on from taking statins that go away when they stop taking them yet you know the mainstream pretty much denies this what the larger point here is i think the idea about cholesterol so the cholesterol hypothesis um you know you mentioned uh nina teicholz uh and and of course she's done, you know her great book you know talks all about this about how the cholesterol hypothesis got started and the cholesterol hypothesis of heart disease has gotten so embedded that it's 
just, you know, virtually impossible to dislodge. Um, it, and and so that this the statins idea supports the idea of of you know cholesterol as a cause of heart disease. There's an interesting chart um, that uh, Tim Noakes had uh, put up that he, that he and his team made showing the relative risks of various um, heart disease factors for heart disease. Um, so high LDL cholesterol came in at a relative risk of something like one, 1 1.27, right? So 27% increase, uh, if you had high LDL cholesterol, whereas having, having type two diabetes was, uh, something like an 11 fold increase in your risk of heart disease. Uh, and it, you know, it was even stronger than smoking. And so this is, this is something that, you know, when you start getting into this and you see, you know, diabetes and insulin resistance, you see it everywhere. And it's, and it's so hard to understand how they have not seen it or they have overlooked it, the, how the main, you know, mainstream medicine has done this. Um, it, and, you know, they, right now it's almost impossible, uh, it, it's all, it, it's difficult to, to look at it this way, because what does that do to the cholesterol hypothesis? It's basically, you know, the cholesterol hypothesis is what so much of modern medicine is built on. You know, there are other things too. Um, this is not directly nutritional related, but sunshine. Okay. So, you know, way back in, uh, now we're getting really controversial. You're going to tell us to look at the sun, to, 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 to expose ourselves to the sun. Are you sure? It's, it's incredible, isn't it? Right. Uh, I mean, so, you know, again, like 40, 50 years ago, they started telling you, oh, well, this, you know, getting, you know, too much sunshine causes skin cancer. So avoid the sun. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of people for the last 40, 50 years have been doing that. They won't venture outside without slathering themselves with sunscreen. And, uh, and so what consequences has this ha had? You know, you have a massive uh, epidemic of vitamin D deficiency, which is totally related to uh, severity at, uh, of COVID infection and the likelihood of getting the infection. Uh, people who are vitamin D deficient have a much worse time of it. So this is mainstream advice that has, um, you know, to you know, some dermatologists started saying this, and and is then nobody stopped to think, well, hmm. You know what might be any adverse consequences of, of you know avoiding going out in the sun. So the the you know the mainstream is is full of these kinds of things that you know they've either overlooked, they're looking at the wrong thing, they tell us to do you know something, not realizing what the other consequences are. Um, you know the 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 seed oil thing, which I know you you've talked. Uh, about on Twitter, you've mentioned that, that, that this, this is just crazy. Um, you know, the, the, the seed oils and, and for those, you know, this, this is seed oils is kind of a term of art. These are vegetable oils, right? But they're really made of seeds. So these are corn oil, soybean, safflower, canola, um, all these things. These are seed oils, vegetable oils, very, very cheap until approximately 150 years ago, no human being ever consumed them at least in any kind of quantity, you know, might've been here and there in different places in history, but they what happened was that, that, that there were, uh, you know, some industrialists with a bunch of cotton seeds on their hand. These were a waste product. And so they're like, huh, you know, we, we just, we just got done harvesting and milling the cotton. Now we got a mountain of cotton seeds. What are we going to do with them? Hmm, how can we make money? And at this, you know, at this time, somebody invented some industrial milling machinery that, yeah, hey, put the cotton seeds in, hmm, out comes oil. And so the seed oils were born. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Crisco, the, which is uh, the, the name Crisco, that's an acronym for crystallized cottonseed oil. That came out in 1911 and caught on because, again, all this stuff's really cheap. It was cheaper than butter or tallow or something like that. And um, so people started 
consuming them massively. Now, this is before really they were, they were told to do so. So we're talking about early in the 20th century, but they did start consuming them. Heart attacks started rising massively. There was virtually no such thing as a heart attack in the early 1900s. One of, one of the uh, uh, most well-known cardiologists of the mid 20th century was Paul, Paul Dudley White. He, he, he was one uh, who uh, helped treat Eisenhower when he had his heart attack. He said that when he started practicing cardiology, they didn't even think about heart attacks because nobody had them. Um, you know, this would have been like before 1920. So heart attacks started rising massively and peaked in around 1965. They've been going down since then. Um, and so there are other factors. I don't, you know, I don't want to say it's it totally seed oils, but, you know, this is probably a major factor. Cigarettes were another one because cigarette smoking increased massively in the 20th century. Um, but in any case, uh, these seed oils do lower your cholesterol if you consume them. So, you know, they started saying, well, you should, you should use these things instead of eating all that nasty saturated fat that's in meat. Um, and so, you know, people started consuming them and, you know, they, they are, they are bad news. Um, and they're in all ultra processed foods precisely because they're so cheap. It's a cheap source of fat. You, you can put them in there. Um, so it's still really the official, um, official advice that you should be consuming more of these things. You should cut back yeah. on your saturated fat and, and consume, you know, corn oil or whatever. This, the, this might be the um, biggest single change that you could uh, make to your diet. If you just get rid of all of these uh, hydrogenated seed oils, basically everything that comes in a big uh, container from a supermarket and replace it with animal fats. You're coming straight from uh, animals. I think that might be the biggest difference. I've seen people witness enormous changes in their health when they've just made this one small little shift. Um, they, they weren't even out to lose a lot of weight, but they, they read about seed oils and then they cut, it, cut them out, replaced them with, tea, with uh, tallow or ghee, and um, they've witnessed enormous improvements. I think it's, it's outstanding just how damaging these things are. And when you read about how they're made, yeah, I mean, it's just... You can imagine that the majority of ailments that people experience today are massively exacerbated by the fact that they're eating industrial waste. Um, but yeah, as you said, this is this is still official advice from the World Health Organization, from uh, the CDC, from the NHS in uh, the UK. They all tell you to cut down on your saturated fat and to use these polyunsaturated fat oils um, and, you know, when they're being generals, they'll tell you, um, you know, you should have olive oil, which I think is kind of a scam because most olive oil is really just uh, repackaged uh, soybean oil. It's, it's difficult to tell the difference between olive oil and soybean oil, even in laboratories. It's, it, it'll be difficult because they're very, very, very similar. So um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of these seed oils that are in um, olive oils. And olive oil uh, doesn't have the same kind of uh, profile as, uh, you know, the healthy animal fats that people are used to. But there's just so much <laughs> really disinformation. Uh, I'm going to keep using this word because it, because it, it's, it's not like it's just somebody who's saying something wrong. It's somebody who's, it's really disinformation. They're putting out systematic information to try and get people to eat things that are not good for them because... You know, it's uh, it's it, it, it's marketing and uh, it works. It's amazing. The 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 disinformation that that's interesting because it it's true. So there, um, you know, way back in the sixties and seventies, um, you know, the uh, doctors and scientists were very enthusiastic about um, lowering cholesterol. We're gonna you know we're gonna solve this heart disease problem by you know, lowering people's cholesterol because they believe that cholesterol was, uh, you know, what, what was doing it. And so they figured out that these uh, seed oils, the polyunsaturated fats do lower cholesterol. Yeah, they do. Um, and so there were a, a number of trials of doing this. Um, in, in one of the first trials um, that was done in California, they, they found that um, the this was uh, an all men in the in the trial that that the men who 
um, use the most seed oils that, you know, got rid of the saturated fat and use the most seed oils had something like a 30% higher, uh, risk of dying of cancer. Um, and that was like, well, whoops, you know, um, so then, um, there were a couple of other, there were a lot of studies, but there were, there were two that are very notable. Um, one is a Minnesota, uh, Minnesota diet, uh, diet study, Minnesota diet study. I may be getting the exact name wrong. Anyway, it was done in Minnesota and uh, another one done in Sydney, Australia. And, um, this Minnesota study was basically much of the data was buried. So just a few years ago, um, a researcher, uh, a team led by a scientist named Christopher Ramsden, they, got in touch with uh, a man whose father was uh, part of this, you know, part one of the scientists running this experiment. And his father had boxes of printed data and, and magnetic tapes with data and this kind of thing, you know, in the attic. And so they got all this stuff out and they went and reanalyzed everything. And they found that the people who were, um, you know, consuming the seed oils instead of saturated fat had had a higher death rate. Yeah, their cholesterol went down and they died at a higher rate. And this was seemingly all covered up at the time um, because it was just totally blew away their cholesterol hypothesis and the idea that seed oils uh, could be good for you. Very similar thing happened with the uh, Sydney diet heart study. Um, and, uh, you know, so there, you know, there's, there's just this abundant evidence that, that, you know, seed oils are really bad news. Uh, furthermore, I mean, if you really want to get into it, low cholesterol is, is a mortality risk factor. So when, when people have their cholesterol lowered, uh, below about 180 or something like that, risks of death go up quite a bit. Um, and you know, this is just overlooked. And when you, you know, when you get down to cholesterol levels of 130 or, or thereabouts, you find high rates of uh, violence of, of uh, you know, these, these people are dying in murders and suicides and accidents and so on. So is that cause and effect? Well, I don't, I guess we don't really know, but it's quite, you know, what do you look for correlations for you? You look so you can see if you can figure out what's going on. Um, and then, there, there are a number of studies where they found that people with high cholesterol live longer. And uh, this is especially prominent in people over the age of 60. Um, and, and so a number of studies have found this. So this, in a nutshell, you know, the mainstream is telling us you got to lower your cholesterol because cholesterol causes heart disease and you can do it by quitting eating saturated fat and consuming these seed oils. And it's just, well, it's all wrong. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, w one of the things that is mind blowing when you read about uh, fiat sciences like uh, modern nutrition is really whoever uh, gets to call the funding, whoever gets to assign the funding, gets to assign the null hypothesis, and then uh, the money is only going to go towards studies that. Um, you know, arrive at the conclusion that is desired. It's just it's it's so blatant right. once you actually dig under the surface. You know, if you look at the if, if you look at the surface where you just see the press releases that make it into the New York Times and into your local newspaper and CNN, then it looks like you know the, this ideal image of um, the scientific process where uh, you know government funds these researchers and they come up with the answer and they come up with the right mix of foods for you to arrive at. But, uh, and, and then it's communicated in a press release to the New York Times and then they publish it uh, in a language that uh, normal people can understand. But really, if you dig under the surface, you see that um, you get funding if you can conclude the things that they want. You don't get funding, you don't get published. And it's just, um, one of my favorites is how they, they continuously keep coming up with results that run against their hypotheses and they just call them the paradox, you know, well, there's the French paradox. <laughs> it's, right. and, and, and it's, it, it's true in economics and it's true in nutrition. Whenever you see them use the term paradox, 
just my mental trick is, all right, imagine that this just makes perfect sense and that's how the world works. And then, yep, that's actually how it is. You know, so how the, how did the French manage to have so much uh, little or so little uh, heart trouble when they eat a lot more fat than everybody else? Maybe there is no paradox. Maybe eating animal fats is the thing, way to go. And that's, that's it. It's just, it's, it's a result that disproves everything that they want to believe. So they just call it a paradox and continue believing what they want to believe. And then, you know, a lot of people get research funding to research this paradox and continue to act puzzled and surprised about it. <laughs> as long as we don't challenge the, um, you know, the official story, the null hypothesis we want to preserve. It, it, absolutely. Yeah. The, the paradox thing is, is, uh, yeah, it's funny. I mean, and, and the funding that you, that you mentioned, this is so true. Um, you know, s most scientists are, uh, how would you want to say they're working people like everybody else? Maybe, maybe they, uh, you know, they're middle-class people, they have jobs anyway, put it that way. And they want to continue the funding. Their jobs are dependent on funding. And when the funding comes from the government or when the funding comes from a drug company, then, you know, they want to give those people satisfaction for their money, value for their money. And so they, they only, you know, study things that are likely to give those uh, results. Um, and furthermore, if they get negative results, these are often not published. Um, so it, especially if they're funded by a drug company, um, they, they will just be buried and not published. There had been you know, a lot of uh, investigation in this looking at, um, you know, w w when you look at some paradigm, like say, you know, antidepressants, for example, um, when they go and they, they some people have uncovered some of these unpublished studies and they find out, you know, the studies, the studies that go unpublished are overwhelmingly negative, while the studies that are published are overwhelmingly positive for what, you know, whatever view they want to look at. Um, so this is publication bias. This is a real thing. So you can you can look in the scientific or medical literature and you know, see various things, but you can't take this totally at face value because some of the results have not been published. Um, there, there's a fairly well-known quote uh, from uh, Marsha Angel, who used to um, be the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most uh, prestigious medical journals in the world. She said that it's no longer possible to publish or to trust any uh, published study in the scientific or medical literature. And, you, you know, so because, because of the drug company funding and, you know, they, they are determined to get the results that they want. Yeah. So how do you navigate, um, fiat science journals? I'll tell you personally, um, one of the liberating things about the carnivore diet is that I don't have to pay attention to nutrition science much anymore <laughs> because it's very simple. All of nutrition science can be summarized with one sentence. Your body is made up of meat, bones, and water. So you need to eat meat, bones, and water. For me, it's, you know, I, I when it comes to food, I think uh, primitive caveman was capable of understanding it all the animals of the world are able to understand how to eat. You know, there isn't a single species that has an obesity problem except the, spe except the animals that we domesticate and feed our garbage. So every species, every culture, every human, every human tribe that has ever existed has managed to eat, has, has not had existential questions about what to eat and has not needed to develop an entire science uh, to figure out what to eat except modern man. Modern man is the only one to develop a science and also the only one to develop um, epidemic obesity where everybody's basically overweight and everybody's unhealthy. I don't think this is entirely a coincidence. <laughs> I think, um, you know, this isn't just correlation. I think, uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> I mean, um, we, we recently had an episode here with Tom Woods where we uh, went to a discussion discussing the um, drawbacks of mass literacy. 
And I think um, I'm going to further this here now when you know, the drawbacks of um, mass nutrition science and just the idea that we need to study scientifically nutrition science makes people so confused that they think that they need to listen to somebody who has a PhD in order to figure out what to eat. Like, no, you know, all the animals can figure out what to eat without needing to listen to somebody with a PhD. And thinking about uh, needing to listen to somebody who has a PhD makes us um, stop listening to our inner animal, which knows how to eat and can figure out what to eat without having uh, a PhD and without having to resort to a PhD. So once I, you know, once I, the most important maybe thing that I quit is probably seed oils. Probably number two was PubMed. Once I stopped <laughs> <laughs> worrying about what PubMed says about diet and just eating meat and drinking water, uh, everything started getting better. Um, because it's really simple, but still, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm exaggerating here. I think I, th I still think there's a lot that's useful there. I see you post a lot of studies, so you do read a lot of uh, academic studies about nutrition. So, first of all, how do you navigate these studies to know what's worthwhile and what's not, and um, what are some important things that you've learned from uh, these studies? Um, yeah. So you know, I was just mentioning the other day on on twitter that um there's a massive medical literature i was looking through some of it. there's a massive medical literature about type 2 diabetes so um maybe deservedly so because it's a huge problem so a lot of people are studying it and you know and just looking over some of it i realized that probably less than one percent of this literature tells people that if they stopped eating sugar, refined grains and seed oils, that they could reverse their diabetes. I mean, they're, they're all talking about this drug and that drug and what to do here and, you know, how to manage their chronic kidney disease or what have you, um, without saying, Hey, you know, if, if these people weren't eating what they did, maybe they wouldn't have type two diabetes. Just, just a small fraction of the literature even goes anywhere near this. So, and, you know, I mean, there there is a massive scientific and medical literature on just about everything, you know, so for me personally, how to navigate it is, you know, the vast majority of that stuff I ignore. Um, and, and in terms of nutrition itself, like what is worth looking at? I, I mean, I look at a lot of things that aren't directly maybe directly related to nutrition. I have a lot of curiosity, for example, about aging and so on, how all that works. So that that's another story. But as far as nutrition, most of, so, you know, here's, here's the thing. A couple of years ago, uh, about two and a half years ago, I think it was, um, the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, which is a, you know, prestigious medical journal, published an article and it was actually a series of articles written by a group. Uh, it was uh, 17 different authors, and these were various MDs, PhDs, and everything. And they decided to look at um, the evidence, pro and con, about eating meat in terms of health. And they, so they went over all this thing, uh, all, all, all this literature and everything, and their conclusion was is that any evidence that meat is bad for you is incredibly weak and that it's not worth even doing a thing about that. If you eat meat, a certain amount of meat, keep on doing it because there's no evidence to tell you otherwise. That's what they said. This caused an uproar in the, in the nutrition area. There were people fr from the very top, like, Walter Willett, for example, the, the, the country's probably the world's most famous nutritionist at Harvard. And, you know, and, uh, and a lot of other people that were, you know, that are well known in this area calling for censorship. They wanted this article taken down. They, 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 the authors were vilified. They said this article should never have been published. They wanted it retracted, all this kind of thing. Um, because of course, it went against their anti-meat religion. Uh, I mean, that's what it is at this point. It's, it's, a, it's a religion. B but in my view, the most telling part of the, this, that episode, of that article, was that they said, 
that the evidence is so weak that, you know, we can't make any recommendation either way. And what that says is that the evidence has always been very weak. Anybody who's looked into the scientific literature on eating meat knows that the evidence is, you know, whatever evidence they've used has been very weak. Why is it weak? Well, for one thing, they've used nutritional epidemiology, which cannot show cause and effect. Okay. Um, in nutritional epidemiology, they use these fruit food frequency questionnaires, which uh, have been shown to be next to worthless. Let, let's put it that way. You know, you, you sit somebody down, give them a questionnaire, and they have to try and remember everything they ate over the last year. I mean, really, seriously, it's like, you know, how many times in the last year did you eat pickles? You know, it's like, uh, okay, I'll think of some number, but that goes into, you know, their, their scientific method. <laughs> Um, so, so there's that part and, and then they, they find, you know, very weak associations. Now there's something in, uh, you know, in this area called healthy user bias. So, um, healthy user bias basically means that people who do one sort of, uh, you know, health practice, for example, eating some certain food also do some other certain health practice because they're health conscious people. And so then their, their overall health gets attributed to the first practice. So for example, vegetarians, there have been a few studies um, showing that, you know, they have better health and so on, lower mortality rates. Um, it, there, and there have been other studies that don't, I, I need to add that. But you look at healthy user bias, somebody who becomes a vegetarian has listened to all the health advice that has come down from on high because they're health conscious and they want to be healthy. These people are also less likely to be overweight. They're less likely to smoke. They're less likely to drink to ex excess. They're less, they're more likely to exercise all those things. It doesn't have anything to do with their, with not eating meat. So this is the kind of evidence that has been used for decades, um, you know, to support this thing incredibly weak, or it, as, as they said in, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, you know, low certainty evidence. So, you know, though, I guess I'm repeating myself, but those of us who have looked into this thing have known all along that it's very low certainty evidence. They, they, um, they find these associations, much of which is due to healthy user bias, but they don't talk about healthy user bias. They just trumpet it from the skies that, hey, we found this study that shows that, you know, eating X causes cancer. Um, it, in most cases, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's just absurd. I, I, I mean, you know, Dr. John Ioannidis of Stanford said that most published research findings are false, um, it, you know, it, because he's, he's looked at things like that and said, you know, how can you reach this conclusion based on this data? You, you can't. This is, you know, this is the secret out there that, you know, they, that so much of nutrition, you know, PubMed nutrition, you might say, you know, is based on these, these kinds of things. Like I, like I just talked about. Yeah. Um, one of my, uh, uh, pet peeves is the pseudoscience that is epidemiology. Having, uh, studied Austrian economics and, uh, mainstream economics, I've come to the conclusion that, uh, macroeconomics is basically, uh, a pseudoscience. And the Austrians have a very powerful critique of the aggregative method with which uh, macroeconomics functions. And basically, once you're dealing with uh, statistics across populations, um, there's just so much room for uh, creative interpretation and data manipulation that you can look at any statistics and weave whatever story you want. And ultimately, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's counterproductive as a way of study. And I think with epidemiology, um, I mean, before the um, recent uh, pandemic crisis, epidemiology was something that I always thought was ridiculous, but uh, I, I had no idea how dangerous it could be. And then in um, 2020, we got to see the incredible destructive power of this uh, silly pseudoscience, wherein, I, and I think... Now, the key thing is that it gives people this idea that diseases and illnesses are uh, pre-programmed to travel through populations, that there is a, you know, this is going to kill a certain percentage of us 
and it's going to be a matter of uh, it's, it's a lottery whether it's going to be you or me when and and once you the more you think about it from the perspective of you know overall numbers and aggregate numbers the less you think about what actually matters which is this is an individual health issue there you know populations don't get sick individuals get sick individuals are the ones that are healthy and it doesn't um it's it, it matters much more to your health how your health is rather than any one particular virus so the, you know instead of <laughs> looking at all these models and simulations being produced by uh, the world health organization and other various uh, organizations that hire these kind of uh, pseudoscientists instead of looking at all these charts and arguing online about r0 and so on you know, people should have been lifting and eating meat and getting sun. Now, I, I, the fact that we have this epidemiology directs people's attention away from what actually works, which is eat well, maintain good metabolic health, avoid being uh, overweight, try and get fresh air and sun as much as you can. I mean, this is what really would have worked. And two years later, we now see, you know, everybody now admits that, yeah, this is this makes a big difference. Like if you have good vitamin D, if you have good nutrition, uh, the virus was unlikely to cause you a lot of trouble. And I know a lot of people like that. I personally had it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a big problem. I got over it in a few days. Everybody I know that is like that ended up shrugging it off. Everybody that's healthy ended up shrugging it off. People who are very old, people who are very out of shape had the most trouble with it. And um, so, you know, your personal, uh, your personal health decisions will matter much more to you than any kind of uh, fear porn that you watch on CNN. But epidemiology feeds the fear porn on the one hand and makes people helpless to think about what they can do. And the more dangerous thing is that it makes them think that the answer is, has to come from government. It has to be uh, centrally planned. You know, I'm going to sit home and eat Doritos and not move for a month. And I expect the government to throw uh, the people who want to go to the gym in jail to protect me. You know, you start thinking about it. If, if we just, it, since, it's a, since it's portrayed as a collectivist problem in your mind, that there is this certain percentage of the population that's going to be dying, and then we're going to get this many cases every day, then the answer is also a collectivist answer. We need a top-down answer. And that's that's the dangerous thing about it. And of course, in, in nutrition, as you said, it's the same um, it's the same thing. Okay, so getting into aging, what interesting things do you know about the science of aging? And what you know, what works? Uh, we've spoken a lot about uh, what doesn't work and about fiat medicine. Uh, now let's get to what actually works. I've heard you mention the, um, often. I've heard you mention metformin and rapamycin as drugs. What's their deal? Yeah, so those are very interesting. Uh, rapamycin seems to be the more potent of the two. Met, metformin, I, I'll tell you, based on what we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, metformin is proposed as an anti-aging drug and has extended lifespan in lab animals, healthy lifespan. Um, and what you know, what does metformin do? It lowers blood glucose and, and, uh, and insulin levels. It's basically, a, a, you know, it's an anti-diabetic medicine. So that shows you the, uh, parallels between obesity and diabetes on the one hand and aging on the other, that if you can avoid the obesity and the diabetes, you're going to age slower. Rapamycin. So this is a very interesting uh, drug. Um, these are both prescription drugs, by the way. Um, rapamycin is very interesting. It, it's it's been referred to as fasting in a pill. So here here once again you see the parallels between you know excess food on the one hand and aging on the other. So um, you know rapamycin is is doing that. There are many you know, mechanisms as to how these drugs may work um, that are being investigated. So I don't want to oversimplify that, but, but, but definitely there are parallels there with the obesity and so on. Rapamycin has been shown to extend lifespan in lab animals. Um, and there are now a number of people who are taking it. This is one of those things that, um, 
you know, relates a little bit back to some of your concerns, Safedine, because um, if, you know, if people wait for the FDA to to uh, approve this use of rapamycin, uh, they're going to be dead first. All right. So, so many people are saying, look, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to give this a try. And there are doctors out there who are prescribing it explicitly for anti anti aging purposes. So um, these yeah, these are fascinating. Um, and, you know, this is also interesting in that both of these drugs are relatively cheap. Metformin itself is dirt cheap. It's literally like five or six cents for a dose. Rapamycin somewhat more, but the fact is they are both generic and unpatented and relatively inexpensive, and therefore uh, drug companies can't make a lot of money with them. So they're, they're busy looking at a lot of other things. Whereas these, these two drugs, you know, that are potential uh, healthy lifespan extenders are already here. There's also a lot of, um, uh, you know, there are, there are a number of startup companies that have a lot of money behind them that are, are looking into uh, various anti-aging technologies when, it, it, in my opinion, they people should be looking at what's right in front of them and, and what is here already that, um, but of course it's hard for anybody to make money off that, not only the drugs, but be, before, before even getting to the drugs there, you know, it, it's basically, you know, the, the, the sun steak and steel lifestyle is what you want to look at. Body composition is just, incredibly important for aging. Again, here's the parallels between obesity and aging. Again, you don't want to get that way. You want to have relatively low body fat and relatively high muscle. That is what is going to, um, you know, slow down aging. Um, you know, you want to have adequate vitamin D levels, you know, then we get into sun and fresh air, all this kind of thing. You want to eat well, um, you know, because eating well is going to also, uh, you know, feed into the body composition, right? You, it, it's pretty tough to have, you know, you can lift all the weights you want, but if you're not eating right, it's going to be tough to have good body composition. So all, all those things, um, you know, are, are very important to aging. And, um, you know, so, you know, just, it's interesting, just living a healthy lifestyle. Um, if people, if uh, so, so the, the average, um, you know, the, 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 the life expectancy of, a, of an American man at birth right now is something like 76, 77 years old. Um, it, it's actually declined in recent years. Um, but if somebody, if, if that same man doesn't smoke, uh, doesn't become overweight, gets regular exercise, um, eats right, uh, and drinks alcohol moderately, then the life expectancy goes up to 90. Um, so, you know, these things are all right here, all readily available. Um, and, uh, you know, but most people, I, I, I suspect think of, um, aging as just something that happens that they can't, that they can't control, whereas they, you know, they definitely can control it. Furthermore, a lot of people have misconceptions about what it's all about. So, you know, a very, a very common, um, reply to the idea of, of, you know, I want to live longer is, um, you know, I, I don't want to spend five or 10 more years in a nursing home. Um, you know, okay, well, that's understandable. I don't either. That, that's not the point. What you want to do is have more years of healthy lifespan. Since, since aging is a uh, strong uh, chronic disease risk, right? In other words, heart disease, cancer, and so on are massively increased uh, as people get older. Um, fighting aging means that you're not going to have you're going to have lower risk of those chronic diseases as you get older. So the ideal would be what is sometimes called uh, compression of morbidity. That sounds rather technical, but it's simple. It just means morbidity, sickness. It means compression of it. So the situation we have right now 
is, you know, somebody becomes, let's say somebody gets into their forties or something and they start developing chronic illnesses and then they have them for the rest of their life. And you have this long decline. What the, the ideal would, would be, you know, you don't have these diseases at all and you live healthy until you die or very shortly before you die. So that's compression of morbidity. It's also been discussed in terms of health span rather than lifespan. So the amount of your life that you go through without any chronic diseases. There, um, there's an interesting study looking at women. So this was a part of the nurses health study, I believe. So it was one of these gigantic epidemiological studies where they looked at hundreds of thousands of, uh, uh, of female nurses. Um, and so, uh, they, they defined a term healthy, healthy survival, and they looked at healthy survival at age 70 and they define healthy survival as no chronic diseases, um, good physical function, good mental health, and no cognitive decline. And they found that only 10% of the nurses had healthy survival at age 70. So that's pretty sad, really. Um, and it doesn't need to happen. Um, so the, you know, the, the basic things that you can do for your health also slow the aging process. And you know, that's what people should look at first, in my opinion, there are other interesting things going on like rapamycin or metformin. There are definitely going to be worth looking at and are worth looking at. There are some other things, um, you know, there's other research involving th um, a lot of other things. Um, but so to my mind, though, you know, staying healthy in the ways that we, um, already know about in terms of diet and exercise, healthy body composition, and so on. That is the way that everyone can fight aging. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree. All right. What about um, uh, exercise? What are your thoughts on exercise? What should people uh, focus on? Not aerobic, right? You're, in, you're into strength. Co correct. And so it's interesting you brought that up because this is another uh, area where the mainstream has been, uh, you know, off center, let's say. So, you know, it's difficult to critique exercise because, you know, face it for, it, you know, any exercise is going to be better than not doing any. Right. And, and most people don't do any. So, you know, anyway, in the, in the mid 1960s, um, uh, Dr. Kenneth Cooper wrote a book called Aerobics, and he posited that there was this sort of unique um, uh, modality of exercise called aerobic exercise, which was basically moderate exercise done at a steady state, steady pace for an extended length of time, i.e. jogging, cycling, running, what have you, these kind of things. So this became very popular. Um, th the thing is, this doesn't address muscle. So, you know, what is the importance of muscle? Here's another thing that happens in aging. We lose muscle. Um, this can be detected as early as uh, it, when somebody is around 30 years old, that they have less muscle they, than they did when they were 20. And this accelerates and greatly as the decades go by, such that when someone is 80 years old, they can, they can have lost 50% of the muscle that they had when they were 20. Um, so this is all associated with aging and, and in terms of the very elderly, this is a disaster. Um, when it goes too far, it's called sarcopenia, which is pathologic loss of muscle. And, and, um, uh, and, and then that leads to frailty that leads to people be needing help for everyday living, which leads to nursing homes and so on. So that that's really bad. You want to fight that process as much as possible to, to fight aging. So aerobic exercise does not address that at all. Um, whereas strength training does. Uh, and so, you know, obviously lifting weights or doing other forms of strength training will increase your muscle strength and muscle mass. The thing is also, if done in certain ways that uh, weight training or strength training also functions as cardiovascular exercise, as aerobic exercise. So this, this is something that is another thing is very overlooked um, and, and that, you know, you, you can get 
you can get good cardiovascular fitness from weight training alone if it's done properly. Um, and so that is what I advocate. It's, a, it's very important. Uh, it's a very important to do strength training to uh, slow the aging process and to make sure that as you get older, that you are able to take care of yourself. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I, I agree. Um, now, what about iron? You've written a whole book on iron, and you say that it's very important for aging. Why? What's the case there? Yeah, well, that's interesting. Uh, I Yes, I wrote a book about it, and then I, I recently wrote an academic article about it that was published in the journal Aging. Um, so, iron. Um, <clears throat> iron is a necessary nutrient. Every, every living uh, thing, you know, needs iron to survive. Um, and, and so is in the case of mammals, in the case of humans, we have mechanisms to capture iron from our environment. In other words, our food and to hang on to it. Um, and, and so, but we have no controlled way of getting rid of it. Now, in theory, if someone is perfectly metabolically healthy, their iron regulation um, will be also also perfect. In other words, when you get a certain amount of iron in your body, various hormones will signal, okay, we've got enough iron, stop absorbing it from your food. And that happens. When people are metabolically unhealthy, that doesn't happen. Uh, and they keep absorbing iron until it gets quite high uh, in, in their body. Their body iron stores become high. Um, and so there, there's so men in particular can accumulate a lot of iron. Now, women, by virtue of their monthly cycle, lose a certain amount of blood every month. Blood is the, the blood is the main uh, storage organ for iron in the body. So something like 80% of the iron in your body is in your blood. So losing blood means you lose iron. Uh, and so there's a, there's, in, in middle age, say about age 45, men have approximately four to five times the, the iron stores in their body on average than women do. And men at that age have much higher rates of heart attacks and cancer and so on than women. In fact, most women before menopause, you know, generally have pretty good health. And then when menopause kicks in, their health gets worse because, because at least this is this is the hypothesis they're absorbing a lot more iron and they're 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 absorbing iron and not getting rid of it there's a lot of evidence that uh blood donation is healthy for this reason so blood donors have you know uh lower mortality rates for example some some studies have shown extremely lower mortality rates um so there's a lot of evidence that iron is involved in aging, that it is definitely, uh, there's definitely solid evidence that it's related to cancer, uh, that is related to uh, uh, various brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, um, and that getting rid of iron can uh, ameliorate these conditions. Now, as far as iron actually you know, being involved in the aging process itself, um, our, our bodies accumulate iron. They, uh, they have very, various levels of free iron, so-called, without getting too far into the, into the biochemistry here, have deleterious effects on our bodies. So keeping iron stores in a low normal range um, it, uh, appears to be a very good practice for fighting aging. So how do you get rid of iron? Do you recommend bloodletting? So, so ba basically, yes, blood donation is the, the, is the best way to do this. Um, and uh, uh, another thing is that, um, yeah, so there are, uh, there are other ways because not everybody is eligible to donate blood, but d blood donation is the most effective way. When, when people have extremely high levels of iron in their blood, so there are genetic conditions that lead to high iron. Hemochromatosis uh, leads to higher iron. So some people accumulate massive amounts of iron and it definitely affects their health. Um, so when someone is diagnosed with hemochromatosis, 
therapeutic phlebotomy is the is the treatment therapeutic phlebotomy is exactly like blood donation only the blood gets discarded instead of going to a donor um and so uh therapeutic phlebotomy is another option the problem is that uh for most of us that that don't have hemochromatosis is uh so you can measure the store the the iron stores in your body fairly readily with a simple test called a ferritin it's a blood test um, the, the, the ranges of the test that labs and doctors deem normal go very high, much higher than is good for health, in my opinion. So, um, if you went to a doctor, had a ferritin test done and, you know, you're a man and let's say it's 350, um, a doctor is going to look at this and say, that's normal. Don't worry about it. When in my view, you probably should worry about it only when iron levels get sky high do doctors think okay we need to do something about this so this is another area in in my view where um modern medicine you know th this is this is a factor they're just not looking at you you really have to for the most part know about it yourself and and do something about it um, there are doctors out there who will do therapeutic phlebotomy in cases uh, that are not as extreme as hemochromatosis, but they're few and far between and probably have trouble finding one. I see. All right. Um, Stefano has a question for you. Thank you, Saif. And thank you, P.D. Mangan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to listen to you. I've been following you thank on you. Twitter for a couple of years and I got lots of good advice. And perhaps most important, you've been very inspirational because you showed that it's possible to go from middle age to the early 50s when you were not in excellent health and then you actually get so much healthier when you get older, which is, uh, which is great, very useful, thank you. So my question is about fasting. Um, there has been a lot of talk in the last few years about fasting, how it can actually lead to increase longevity and there are different types of fasting, as you know, there is uh, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diet, periodic fasting. So what's your, what are your thoughts on that and do you practice, do you practice it? Um, I do practice intermittent fasting. Yes, it, it looks to be a solid anti-aging strategy. As far as, um, you know, length of fasting, uh, you know, something like, a, so a lot of people follow a, a 16, eight, uh, mm -hmm. way of fasting. So fasting for 16 hours with an eight hour eating window in, in the 24 hours of their day. Um, that's something that's relatively simple as, as to, um, what is optimal um i you know that's that's more uh that's less known let mm -hmm. let's say um obviously it depends on goals if someone had a lot of weight to lose longer fasting might be uh you know more beneficial what happens well it's it's interesting so you know long relatively long ago 19 1930 or thereabouts uh, scientists discovered that calorie restriction uh, slows aging and extends mm -hmm. lifespan. Um, so they were doing this in lab animals, in you know lab rats. It was kind of a surprise when they discovered it because wow, less food and they live a lot longer. You know that it, it kind of counterintuitive there. More recently, so so there's been lots of investigation into how calorie restriction works to extend lifespan and health span. More recently. They, some scientists have uncovered something interesting. So when, when you, when you're doing this, um, uh, type of science, you, you, you know, you've got some lab rats in a cage and you're doing calorie restriction and so on, and you're in your lab and all that, and you go in once a day and you feed them. Well, the rats are very hungry at the time. And so they eat all their food at once and then they're fasting until the next time you feed them. So the question is, is it calorie restriction or is it fasting that's extending mm -hmm. their lifespan? So there are uh, those scientists out there that have, uh, at least, if not demonstrated, at least produced some very good evidence that it's the fasting that's extending their lifespan and not the fact that they were eating less food. So fasting is, is definitely uh, a good health practice and, and something that can extend lifespan and health span. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And thanks for your kind words. That was very nice of you. Um, uh, Nathan? I've uh, wrestled with type 2 diabetes my 
most of my life, uh, self-inflicted through diet and smoking and alcohol and so forth. And I've seen 12 different internal medicine doctors over the years. And none of them understood diabetes. I, I had to figure it out on my own. There is no book on diabetes I haven't read. I, I, I could build a library. What finally worked for me was fasting. Uh, and I didn't know about fasting at the time. I simply read a stupid article that said, if you don't eat on Wednesday, you will cut your calories by this much. And I went, oh, okay. It was something I could mentally do. So I did it. And as a result, I lost 160 pounds. Wow. Subsequent to that, uh, my diabetes was still a problem. It got much, much better, of course. Uh, but due to some infections and surgery, I got forced on to insulin, taking shots for type 2 diabetes. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Fung and his books on fasting. Yes. Uh, I stumbled onto that, and my wife and I started challenging each other to what kind of fasting we could try. And we worked ourselves up to thinking we'd do three days. And then I read the article in Fung's book about a 15-day fast, and we made a pact to give it a try. I threw away all of my drugs. I threw away, I cleaned my refrigerator out, all the insulin. I threw it away. I threw away all of the drugs. We cleaned all of the food out of the house. And we went on a 15 day fast and we made it 12 and a half days. And now I take the minimum dose of metformin and keep my blood sugar down. It, it can be reversed. And I'm convinced now that if I build myself up and do another, I think some intermediate or, or some uh, sporadic three day fast, I think I can kill it. It is reversible. I'm a damn poster child. That's great. That's ab absolutely great. And yeah, Mom, like, you, like you said, you went to all these doctors and didn't get the right help. It, it's, it's such a misunderstood disease. It's, it's, it, you know, it's interesting because, because again, I, I mentioned this several times about the parallels between obesity and diabetes on the one hand and aging on the other. So this has been another scientist, scientific uh, discovery is that insulin drives aging. Um, this this uh, Cynthia Kenyon first found uh, first discovered this in the 1990s that uh, when she was working with uh, these little worms called C. elegans that when she, when the d insulin gene was deleted they lived a lot longer. And so this result has been found in a lot of other species and so on. If you keep insulin levels low, then you know that fights aging. And you keep insulin levels l low with the ways I was talking about eat, you know, eat low carb, real whole food, you know, exercise, have good body composition. So that that's, yes, the insulin is related to aging. My, my question there is, do you get much feedback on, uh, on reversing of diabetes? Do you hear many stories on that? Uh yeah, I have. Uh, I, I've heard many stories. Um, people, people have told me a, a very interesting one was just recently a friend of mine on Twitter uh, had his father, his elderly father, who I, I believe was in his mid 80s or something like that, um, was in the hospital. And hospital food is notorious for being terrible. I think maybe this man was in a nursing home. I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, hospital food and nursing home food is notorious for being terrible. I've seen it myself. I, I worked in hospitals for many years. Um, and his, so his father was diabetic. And so he determined he was going to get his father out of there. And he got his father out of there, took him home and um, reversed his diabetes in two weeks just by changing what his father was eating. So 
yes, people do reverse their diabetes. It's now documented in the medical literature. In fact, Roy Taylor, who's done some of the uh, you know original work in showing uh, and documenting the reversal of diabetes, this happened about 10 years ago. So he wrote this paper about reversing diabetes and he heard from some people about this. So they decided to set up a website. So they set up this website that basically how to reverse your diabetes and they gave them some basic information. And then a lot of people access this website and they found that, you know, then they l later looked into this and found that like, you know, 50% 50, 50 of the people who access this website reverse their diabetes just by reading what he put up there on, on, on this website for layman. Um, so it appears, it appears to be officially Dr. Taylor says that it's more difficult to reverse diabetes if someone has had it longer than 10 years. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll have to be agnostic on that. I obviously don't treat people, uh, for diabetes or anything else, but, um, with weight loss and proper diet, the vast majority of people who have had their diabetes less than 10 years can reverse it. And this is something that, um, I don't know, modern medicine isn't telling people that, you know. The other thing to note is when advising people, um, it, it, the impact is uh, almost as immediate as drugs. That's right. what people wrestle with a lot. But if you start fasting and just are, you don't have to get real drastic, but if you're careful, I mean, I, I mostly eat meat, eggs, uh, especially when I was fasting because they seem to work better. But uh, I actually sat and measured my blood sugars meticulously. I wish I would have... Uh, charted at all. I did not. But you could actually monitor it and watch it yourself. It, yeah, it's absolutely. astounding. It's fast. Uh, Dr. Taylor, in his original publication, reversed diabetes in, in his group of patients in a week um, uh, by feeding them a low-calorie diet you know, for a week, and their blood sugars became normal. So that's reversal of diabetes. Yeah, it's fast. It, it makes it easier to help people because they can give it a try and see results. You know, most dietary things don't. don't right. Watch. Right. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, Peter, you have a question? My question was about the environmental impact of monocropping, which is something that PD brought up earlier in the podcast. Uh, specifically because this is an issue that we've talked a little bit about in previous podcasts, basically how you quantify how bad environmental impact is. So PD earlier was saying in the podcast that he sees that the environmental impact of monocropping is very severe. And so I just wanted to ask what sorts of indicators he's using to come to that conclusion and how can we um, make a case to people that aren't convinced by this, that actually this is something that environmentalists should be concerned about. Um yeah, that's a good question, and and I I have to say I'm I may not be the best person to ask about that, um, be, you know, because it's it's the the whole environmental thing is is not really my uh my bailiwick. Um, I just know based on things that I've read and um what I've seen. But if you look at things like um you know runoff uh you, you know uh run environmental runoff, you know, where, where not only nutrients, but pollutants, um, go into bodies of water from farmland. When, when you look at what it does to the farmland in terms of erosion and, um, uh, you know, dust bowl like scenarios, um, you can see that. Whereas, um, pastoral land that that animals are raised on um it you know is home to uh an abundance of different species it's a normal environmental um uh, scenario every everything's good whereas whereas you see what happens in monocropping it involves basically um you know tearing out the infrastructure so to speak and replacing it with your own um so 
you know, what, what we can do. I mean, there are people that are, you know, very much more, uh, you know, that are, that are experts in this, that are talking about this, but it's, uh, it, it's definitely an uphill battle. And, and I, you know, I'm, I really am not sure what we can do to, you know, convince more people about this. Um, so Dennis, tell us a little bit more about where people can find you on the internet. Um, well, Twitter is my, my main venue these days. And I have a website called rogue health and fitness. Um, so those, those are the two main places. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been uh, extremely informative and helpful. Thanks for having me, uh, Savadine. It's, it's, it's been an honor to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good day. You too.